Hi, everybody. This is Lauren Baker. Welcome to today's episode of the Search Engine Journal Show. With me today, I have Ali Schwanke from SimpleStrat. Hey, Ali, how's it going? Hey, I'm doing great. Great to be here. Awesome. Great to have you. So um, thanks to the team at Channable for sponsoring today's episode. Really uh, happy uh, the folks at Channable made today possible. And I hear today we're going to be talking a little bit about YouTube marketing for the B2B um, for B2B companies. So Ali, if you wouldn't mind going over a little bit about your background, uh, what you do, and then um, what got you into YouTube uh, for B2B? Sure. Well, I am the founder of a company that is 100% dedicated to helping folks get uh, set up, build, um, and really execute on the HubSpot platform. And we help folks with everything from um, just kind of figuring out the automation software to powering campaigns through it, which is where, you know, we spend our time helping folks with YouTube if they happen to want to convert people from that platform to HubSpot. And uh, how people might know me is we run a channel called HubSpot Hacks over on YouTube and we have about 18,000 subscribers there. We just crossed over a million views er earlier this year and we're a small team of 10 and we have some contractors in, in that extended network. But uh, often the questions are like, how the heck do you guys do this with a team of 10 and what did you learn and how can you help us supply that in our business? And obviously that's what we're talking about here today. Cool, kind of mirrors everything over here at SCJ, like uh, starting a B2B blog and then companies being like, oh, how can we do that as well? So exactly. Very cool. So HubSpot Hacks, you said that you have over a million views? Yeah, I think we're in like 1.2 million views, maybe something something around there these days. Very cool. Very cool. So um, do you concentrate solely on YouTube when you're putting together B2B strategies, or do you also consider some of the other uh, video networks such as Instagram or TikTok or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, for now, I think one of the biggest things that uh, when we're so because we happen to have a HubSpot uh, emphasis in, in that being like, you need brand technology and, and content like that's the those are the three components that you need to convert folks in today's B2B environment. And YouTube happens to be a place that there is very little competition for most B2B companies. Oh. So if we do help people on YouTube, it's because the barrier to entry is very high. And so the competition is low. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, there's, we're talking about search engine stuff on the search engine show today. There's so much green grass from a search perspective over there, but ideally YouTube is simply one of the places to convert. We do help folks with other types of campaigns too. Nice. Nice. So, uh, you said, you had said, mentioned earlier that you do a lot of tutorials. Um, do you find that a lot of the audience is viewing the videos that you do use for your clients or on a desktop device or a mobile device? And do you see any behavior differences between the two? Um, not so much. I mean, we actually, because we do track both of those things on, uh, the, on the back end. We find that a lot of folks will um, view our content on a desktop because they're on their computer. They're looking for how to do something. And quite frankly, the reason our channel started is because we were finding ourselves sending people to the HubSpot knowledge base and how to do right. something. And it's very simple, like how to add a user. And I'm a very visual learner. A lot of people tend to be visual learners. And I thought, why isn't there a video about this? So we literally just started a like a loom and just shot a very, I mean, terrible version and optimized it pretty well. And it did exactly what we said it would do. Here's how to add a user. And so we just kind of put all of our eggs in that basket and the rest is history. You mentioned that there's sometimes not as much competition within YouTube. Do you think, why do you think companies are overlooking um, YouTube video marketing or videos being part of content marketing, especially on the B2B side? Yeah, there's a couple of components there. One is that the barrier for entry is this belief that you have to have really, really high profile, like like the best production in the world to have the best channel. So what often happens is instead of going with like a search and a, we'll call it like, what does the searcher or the user want mentality first? Instead, they like hire a video company and they make this really amazing branded video experience, which Lauren, you and I used to do that like in the early 2000s and that would be your website, your one website video right. we put it on youtube because you're supposed to and then we get about 50 views and like five of those are like our mom and our dad and our uncle right so the reason why it's not happening is because there's there's that thinking that's still there the second thing is um the way you go about building lead gen on youtube is linked just like it is to blogging you have to be consistent and you have to consistently talk in the way your customers want you to talk pretty much any B2B company that I have analyzed online in, in working with them, they put out videos like 
if we were putting a video out today, it'd be called, um, let's say, the inner workings of the analytics behind the YouTube algorithm that every CEO needs to know. That's terrible. Nobody talks like that. Like the CEO wants to know, can YouTube give me an ROI um, in getting new customers? Okay. Talk like they talk. So because you don't talk like they talk, um, the videos don't get created with the search intent. They don't hold viewership. And quite frankly, most people don't know the things you do in video to keep a user or a viewer engaged. You have to change scenes. You have to have words on this. Like you have to do things to keep us engaged. And most, uh, most marketers haven't actually taken any video marketing or done the analytics on video marketing to know how to do it. So. So you think just people think that the barrier of entry is just way too high, a little bit unknown, things along those lines. Now, is YouTube making it easier or are there any tools out there that are making it easier for people to be able to say once you do, once someone does like a, a normal, boring <laughs> loom style um, tutorial, are there ways to spice that up, right? Uh, like putting a highlight in the front or, or whatever it may be. Like what, what, what are some tips there? Yeah. I mean, I think most, so I'll say one of the other challenges that, that folks have when they're trying to figure out how to use YouTube for B2B is a lot of the advice out there is for creators. So mm -hmm. how does a creator use YouTube? Okay. A 22 year old creator, a 35 year creator, however old you are, that's talking about soap or skateboards or crafting or something. They have some insights for you, but it's not the same way that people use B2B content. It just isn't. And so I think that when we're looking at the reason why the barrier is so high, we have to look at things like what purpose am I trying to fulfill by going to YouTube? Because people want to like, they want to take the pig and they want to shine it up and put lipstick on it. But like nobody wanted the pig in the first place. Right. So what do they want? What content naturally lends itself to be visual? And how do you use that to satisfy someone's need for information? People go to YouTube to how to do something, show me how, and they they go less to be entertained unless you already have a reputation for being funny. And if that's the case, that's like, you know, they'll find you and you can talk about whatever you want. But most business, most B2B content's boring by nature. So videos tend to be boring and they don't go after the search intent, which again, that's where the money's at. Do you think, um, do you think there's any room uh, in B2B video to not be boring? Or do you think it comes across as being too cheesy, like for someone to be cracking jokes or explosions or swipes edits in between, things like that? What, I what think, are you oh, man. Like, I would love to see a lot more content of, of B2B in, in that realm. I think the challenge is, as marketers, we're constantly badgered to show ROI. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's going to land more into the brand category. And if you're not already investing in brand, you're not going to have the budget to do anything that doesn't have like a direct like sign here, do this, go there. The way our ROI comes in from our channel is we get uh, folks that join our newsletter and we get folks that download eBooks. And ultimately, like we now have a webinar series with an open rate. I mean, anybody on this call, would you love an email open rate of 60%? Absolutely. You know why we get that? Because people watch our stuff and then subscribe versus the other way around. So yep. it takes a lot longer to build it, but now you've got this audience that's in your hands, but we've shown up consistently for about three years now. That's a, that's a lot of videos. Very cool. Very cool. So you feel that like YouTube is in a golden moment right now? Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. all the AI is making it so that people want to learn from people. And the biggest question I've seen within the executive community is how can I tell Ali that this is real? And even though we have avatars and that kind of stuff coming into the video state space, most of that still seems very deep fake, eh, scary. And so right. you can you can pick out a human, which is why I think YouTube, having people in your videos, that's the other pushback is, you know what, Lauren, if I have a team of people on YouTube as my company, what if one of them leaves? That also mm -hmm. deters them from putting content on YouTube. Yeah, got you. I see that a lot on the written side too. People are like, oh, we don't really want to put this in someone's name because they may leave and then we have to change it afterwards or what happens then, things like that. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, what about uh, what about podcasting on YouTube? So uh, YouTube does have a podcast tab feature. Um, if someone's not in the full-fledged video content, um, how can someone take advantage of that? 
Yeah, so uh, it was about probably four or five months ago, um, Google released a Google for for podcasts, essentially. So Mm -hmm. prior to this point, if you happen to be running a podcast, you would just upload your episode to YouTube and it would just be like a video with like a thumbnail over it and it would just be audio. That's still the case now, um, unless you record like we are right now and you have a video over the, the podcast itself. You now can upload to YouTube and do what's called a specific playlist for podcasting. Oh, interesting. So if you type in youtube.com, I don't, I don't know if it's a forward slash or whatever it is, but like they're, they're putting their money behind the idea that people, more and more people are podcasting and they want to leverage the video piece of that because they already know that we're repurposing it into videos or of some sort. So when you upload your video to YouTube, if you don't already have a Google podcast or excuse me, a YouTube podcast playlist, you can click in there, say start new podcast, and then it will actually ask you to create a thumbnail just like you would on Libsyn or on uh, Buzzsprout or something of that nature. And then when you upload it, you actually upload it to that list and it's supposed to get indexed in the way that a podcast would get indexed. Now, we're super new to this, like the whole industry is new to this user's adoption of that hasn't been as much as I think that they've wanted it to be, but it is an interesting thing. Like we are some seeing, seeing some additional views from that particular playlist feature. Very cool. Very cool. One question I get a lot of the time is um, when people want to add a video to their website, does it make more sense to embed a YouTube video, say to a landing page or a sales page, or should they be utilizing a tool like Wistia where there's not necessarily distractions after watching the video? Because one of the biggest fears that I see is like after someone's done watching the video, YouTube may recommend three other videos, just take them off on some like uh, distraction road somewhere. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that used to be the case. Like you used to be able to insert a, a query, like a string at the end of that URL that would prevent that from happening. And you can't do that anymore. Um, but I think it really comes down to what your purpose of your YouTube channel is. Mm -hmm. So for the mechanisms we're discussing here today, your YouTube channel, the way we see it, if you use YouTube is YouTube is a search engine and a community growing opportunity. So the more subscribers you have, the more the ability you have to show up on those video cards and the SERP page, blah, blah, blah. If you're embedding that video into a blog, the goal would be if they, if they leave that YouTube video that's embedded in your blog and they find themselves on your YouTube experience, is it like, are they in a new dimension where like, wow, there's so many more videos here. If it's not, then you're just sending them off your site to go like basically go get lost somewhere else. And now you've, now you have lost them. So you should use a Wistia or something, Vimeo, whatever. If you're embedding it on a service page, never, ever, ever, ever embed a YouTube video on a service page. Cause that page has bottom of funnel sales intent you never yeah. want to give them a reason to leave. So you should use some sort of embedded uh, video feature on that page. Got you. Got you. What about on a uh, thank you page? Like one thing that you had mentioned is, um, you know, your list is uh, very active, very clean because you do an opt-in after um, watching a webinar or whatever it may be. Uh, what about utilizing video as a follow-up uh, to once someone submits a lead or a thank you page or any other uses of video on the site or in the customer journey that you feel are important, especially on the B2B side? Yeah, I mean, this comes down to content strategy overall. So when you think about YouTube uh, or just video overall, like if you can get someone into an area of video content that happens to satisfy a very specific thing. So I'll give you an example. For us, we've got an entire playlist called um, HubSpot for Beginners. So if you happen to opt into our list and you tell us this is where lead forms and what questions you're asking of your people opting in is important. Because if they say, I'm on HubSpot Starter, there's a good chance I should never, ever send them to the complicated, advanced, blah, blah, blah videos we have on YouTube. So if I send them to a playlist, though, then they get inundated. And um, like Ryan Dyson, Digital Marketer, calls it like the third day experience of your content. Like you can create videos so that they just are in a rabbit hole. So if I sent them a video every day, Lauren, it'd take 30 days to get to know me. But if I create an experience for you and your journey that you consume 30 days in or 30 videos in four days, because they're just so one after the other. Yes. I've accelerated that relationship building. And that's what we're seeing. Like I, we had two sales closed today because they went and watched multiple channel, multiple videos of ours. They were already convinced we're the one, get the quote, sign it, we're kicking off this week. Like that's how quickly, because you can be in a sales meeting when you're not there. Nice, nice. 
So the video pre pre qualifies, pre educates, and pre sells, or has the ability to. Mm -hmm. And then, how do you get your video in front of someone that often, um, giving them that forty views within three days experience? Yeah. So a lot of it comes down to the. I mean, our channel specifically, we're um, we're running folks through. Um, I mean, we're really just looking at what search intent is. So I've got um, I've got tools like Ahrefs, Semrush, Schmoz, you know, all of those out there. We're looking for what do, what do people search for on Google. How do they search on YouTube? Because those two things are, are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And then um, what other videos, like this is a big piece. What other videos are already ranking? Just like you do in written content. You watch them and you go, okay, a couple questions. One, does this actually help the searcher with their original question? Mm -hmm. Two, when do I get the first inkling that I want to look away, click away, leave the video? What's happening then that our video could do better that would retain them faster, which is a, a um, sign to YouTube that our content's better. Um, the third thing being, how am I going to get them to the video if they're not search? That's where the importance of, we see a lot of traffic from LinkedIn. We see a lot of traffic from Twitter and we see a lot of traffic from Reddit and um, like Quora and those mm -hmm. places where we're not even sharing the video. Someone else shared it on I'm our behalf. Sure. Mm-hmm. That is interesting. That is interesting. Yeah. Um, when, when, when your viewers or customers are sharing your, your content, that's the best feeling in the world. Yeah. Um, so you said LinkedIn and Twitter, right? Both very B2B mind. I mean, LinkedIn obviously is a B2B mm -hmm. social network, Twi Twitter to a degree as well. I think when we, when, at SEJ, when we looked at the, um, uh, basically the behavior of people from social media, um, in terms of the most engagement being a B2B site was LinkedIn and then Twitter, and then I believe maybe Facebook or before Facebook may have been something else like Pinterest, like in terms of like how much people are interacting. So mm -hmm. that makes perfect sense. So if you can make sure, like if someone's publishing a video, make sure you distribute that on LinkedIn, make sure you distribute it on Twitter. Um, what are some other distribution channels or ways to promote that video once it's out and live besides within YouTube? Yeah, I mean, within YouTube is actually a, a loaded question because there's so much to be known about what other videos your video is showing up next to mm -hmm. and that those are called suggested videos. And I think there's a lot of times people will look at brands like, let's say, McKinsey, and they'll say, well, McKinsey has a very professional brand. Okay, McKinsey could publish a blog about donuts and people would read it because they're McKinsey. Like right. they, you can't really look to these giant brands for any audience engagement tactics because they're so big that they really don't need anything new. They just publish and they continue to get eyeballs. If you and I are starting a brand or if we're a smaller, even SDJ, like your thumbnails, what's going to catch someone's eye, the title and how well that um, shows up in the suggested videos is still going to be super huge. And most companies like, if I said, Lauren, I need you to take a different picture every time you shoot a tutorial, most clients look at me like, can't you right. just use my like library of stock photos? And I was like, no, ideally, if you want performance, like we released a video today on merging duplicate contacts and I, mm -hmm. we had our team member, um, take a picture of himself one way and then he turned the other way and our graphic designer made it look like he was merging himself into himself. Mm. Okay. That's funny. It's cool. Like that catches your eye versus just a picture of like a person or a, a stock image. So right. that's going to be important. The other way, way we get folks into is we do a lot with outreach and like we put um, our YouTube channel into our signature in our email. So like that's important because in Gmail, it'll show you as a YouTube um, thumbnail at the bottom of your signatures. So that, that's a piece. Um, and then we're going to be like everything we do, it's integral to our sales process. That's the first thing you ask people is if you haven't heard about our channel, we encourage you to go subscribe right now. So it's just like, it's part of the sales conversation. It's never just like a, something we hope they find. Great. That makes perfect sense. It is part of the sales conversation, right? And if someone can go ahead and subscribe, then you do have the ability to hit them over and over and over and over and over and over again. Absolutely. And, um, you know, to your point, like, uh, YouTube, it's, it's become its own thing, right? It's almost like, yeah, there's YouTube TV and there's, there's multiple other, um, I don't know, streaming services, but just the ability to be in YouTube all day, watching, 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 and watching and watching. Um, it's a huge opportunity. Then also uh, those videos appearing in the search engine results themselves, because Google likes to serve Google properties in mm -hmm. search. So is that a big, uh, is, is that in addition to writing, 
the way that your your target, uh, or I'm sorry, um, speaking the way that your target would want you to if you're talking to them, right? And promotions, is there anything that you do from an SEO perspective to help those videos get visibility within Google results? Yeah, I mean, ideally, we spend a lot of time studying those SERP pages. So if I go to a incognito window and kind of see what pops up, I'm also using uh, SEMrush to help, like they'll show you what the first video results are in the video carousel on a mm -hmm. SERP page. And so we're studying that saying, just like you do in written content, what do these have in common? What are they missing? Is there a reason why this is first? Like sometimes there's a video that comes out of nowhere that ranks yeah. number one and it doesn't even really have a channel. It's just like, what's going on with this? So you have to have as much curiosity with video content ranking as you do with written content ranking. I think the, the other thing that people often miss is when we create content for the SERP page, we often lead with titles. And so we'll lead with like, you know, the 51 best ways to do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. On YouTube, it's much more like how to and show me and about speed and efficiency. So right. if you were going to watch one of our tutorials, it might be like, like I watched one yesterday from, um, there's a, a company called Surfside PPC. They're awesome too. Shout out to those guys. They have a huge channel teaching people PPC and they get a ton of clients from it, just like we do. And their video is the ultimate um, tutorial on Google ads for 2022. I think what it was, what it was. It was a two hour video. And in his video, he said, if you only need to learn about this or this or this, there are chapters below this video mm. that you can go straight to that thing. So it's not just like, we're not trying to trick people into watching our entire video anymore. We're trying to make it easy for them to learn what they came to learn. And then they give us their loyalty because we've been so good to them with helping them find the answer to their problem. And that just, I mean, that's like YouTube magic right there. So do you also trim down those videos to like, if there, if there is five minutes out of a two hour tutorial, and yeah. that's all that someone may need. Do you trim that down to its own video? And then like, maybe it's a preview of the longer one. Cause, cause just personally, if I was, if I was searching YouTube for something and I saw that a video was two hours long, I just wouldn't click on it. Right. <laughs> but I definitely yeah. wouldn't click on a five minute or six minute, um, I don't know, demo or highlight from that. And then, then I'd be like, Oh, maybe I will go ahead and watch that whole thing. Yeah. So what YouTube will do, and it's happening naturally now is, is if you offer chapters in your video description, it will actually index the chapters and show you as a, as a user on Google, it will give you, like, if mm -hmm. I say, let's say how to do, uh, how to add a user, a super admin to my HubSpot portal. That's probably one of the chapters in our managing team members video that you could click right to that video, like that timestamp. But yes, to your bigger question, yes, we would break that out. And then the strategy is just like it would be in written content, where if someone lands on that video, they have no idea that we have a longer video that they may want to see. So it's our job as content marketers and video marketers to say, okay, if someone watches this video, I need to one, make sure at the end, I recommend the big tutorial. And yeah. then two, I use my info cards and I use like additional on-screen opportunities to say, this is merely this teeny piece of this big meal that you might want to have. So, um, and that's where we advise folks on how to use video within like the HubSpot and YouTube environment is all of our HubSpot campaigns we set up with like campaign tracking URLs. So we can see like, we just started pinning a comment to all of the videos and I can see everybody that's converted to our newsletter as a result of what we're calling our comment pin strategy. It's huge because that's the first place people look now that the description's truncated. So just some very interesting things we're seeing from a conversion perspective. It makes perfect sense, actually. Um, I see that a lot on Reddit as well, like because mm -hmm. you can't drop a link in a conversation, yeah. but you can in a comment. So exactly, sometimes traffic comes from my comments a lot more than it would in a, come in a normal um, post. Uh, speaking of like YouTube and its its future, uh, or speaking of 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 short snippets of video, there's two different kinds of video on YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. You have your horizontal landscape style video, and then your more vertical. Um, Instagram, TikTok style, real oriented videos called YouTube shorts. Where do you see YouTube taking this? Is this an opportunity for B2B, um, B2B companies to uh, film shorts as well as long tutorials? And if so, where should they get started? Yeah, and this is a really complicated question because as we were talking about before we started recording, everybody's, everybody's desire to do things is often... Um, stalled by what they have budget for and what they're willing to prove ROI about, especially in a B2B environment. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. And shorts are challenging because the goal of HubSpot shorts as a, as hub, as, as, or sorry, the goal of YouTube shorts as a YouTube user is to keep me on the platform and going through stuff as long as possible. Yes. As a company, that means that you may run out of shorts to watch of mine and all of a sudden you're off in La La Land and all my hard work that I put into these shorts doesn't do me anything except just get a view. So at the end of the day, I can't prove anything. And it's not like I got a lot of subscribers from that either because you're just funneling through shorts. The way that you have to make them pay off is the long game. And there's a former, I cannot think of his name off the top of my head, but he's a former Instagram and YouTube employee that the way he talks about it is if you can use shorts in a way, almost like versions of a night show. So on the night show, you've got like David Letterman used to do like the, or, or maybe it was someone else that used to do like the headlines. Um, and then you've got like the say what karaoke stuff. And then you've got like the guests and like you've, mm. they all like, we don't watch a night show. That's just multiple clips of Jimmy Kimmel talking because that would be boring. And so yeah. they have all these like programming as a B2B company. That's probably the way you could do it. But think about the resources and time dedicated to do that. And a lot of people's budgets are even getting cut in content marketing. Like it's going to be tough for us to like say, this is what we want to do with your B2B content. What I will say is we've been seeing some opportunities to rank for shorts mm. if there isn't content out about it now. So if you create a short, I'll call it rather like homemade sort of video with a short, you're forgiven for lack of quality and it can rank fairly quickly if there's absolutely nothing else out there. So if Salesforce releases, releases a new feature and you talk about it, it probably will get indexed as a short and you could put it out there. Like it happens to be what I'd call like a very quick turnaround opportunity in the market to get some SEO driven content if there's absolutely nothing else out there. So that's how I would recommend using it. Got you. Um, also, is there a way if someone views a short then to give them a link to a longer video or a more tutorial oriented video in the descriptions or anything like that? You can, but I would say that the mechanism there is typically a much more like, because people don't know about you, like the, the shorts are literally just served up just like TikToks. I mean, yeah. you can argue on the efficiency of either platform, but you have to let the user know there is other stuff because you're not likely to click into a description of a short. You just aren't. So it has to be like, you pop something up on it and it's like, do you want to watch the full version of this? And it has to be like a visual component to mm -hmm. tell people to go find the, the other part. You had touched upon AI a little bit earlier, and I wanted to kind of revisit that. Um, you know, when, when people talk about AI and YouTube, a lot of the time they're thinking about things like deep fakes or whatever it may be. Um, but what are some, are there any like productivity angles uh, from utilizing the existing AI tools to the entire video creation process? So if someone is getting their budgets cut or whatever it may be, maybe there's ways to be more efficient um, by utilizing any AI tools out there on the market. Are there any that, that you've worked with and recommend? Yeah, I mean, typically those come into the, we'll call it content repurposing space. So if you wanted to create a bunch of shorts, so if you and I had this this video, we wanted to put it into shorts of like clips out of our interview, um, like a, an AI tool like bigroom.tv. Like bigroom.tv is gonna find your face inside of the horizontal video, crop it to be vertical. Um, they're coming out with more, we'll call it like uh, features that would recognize certain things in an interview. But a lot of those tools are still, I'll call them somewhat premature because you have to have a very simple interface to start with for it to create your, your shorter form content. How I recommend people use AI is less about the editing and more about the strategy. So for instance, I just used, I mean, everyone knows, you know, chat GPT. Hey, chat GPT, what are the most common acronyms used in mm -hmm. the HubSpot space. And so it gave me like a list of, I don't know, like 15 or 20. Okay, I'm going to load those. What would be a short description I could use for each one of those? Give me one that's like, you know, 15 words or less. Okay, now I've got essentially a slide for each one of these and I can create shorts about these acronyms. And now all I need to do is upload a video of myself, like getting the hook. And then it goes to the slide with the definition. And, and so you can see how like it's, it's less about chopping the video up into short bits because I think that's what people want. Yeah. But to be honest, I've watched most of that stuff that gets done automatically and it's just still pretty boring. And you can kind of tell. It's like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, there nice. there are certain spaces where you're going to win because there's literally nothing else out there. But, you know, when we're watching stuff like the AI movie, like the recent Spider-Man, like 
you have to have someone that really knows what they're doing. And let's, let's face it. Most people can't even create good video without AI, let alone like with it. That's true. What about any other trends you see coming up in the end of this year or next year with YouTube? Yeah. I mean, I think we're going to start to see, I mean, I don't, I don't love this trend, but I think we're going to start to see people trying to use avatars to create content on YouTube and, and somewhat stimulate like human presence. Um, like Synthesia is a, is a platform that has people have been using it to do, let's call it like, welcome to company ABC. This is your onboarding right. video. I think we're going to see companies trying to use that to do education. I still think people want to follow creators and personalities. And so I think we're a ways away from that being effective, but you know, I could be wrong. Um, I, I think people are ultimately going to be filming more things that you can't replicate with AI. Like Lauren, I want to see your behind the scenes visit to the Taylor Swift conference concert concert. Oh, I don't, yeah. you know, like <laughs> that, that kind of stuff. So, and I, like, I think we'll start to see, like we go to the HubSpot conference every year as a company, it's going to be important for you to film where you're going in real life with your customers to provide social credibility that you are, you are real. Well, that's an interesting point. And that's also like a, um, a fairly, uh, low, um, low expense, low out of pocket oriented thing. Right. Oh yeah. Um, you see, Hey, this is me. I'm so-and-so I'm here at the, you know, the CES convention here and whatever, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, here's our booth. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're, if you're going to such event, you can find our booth here, whatever it may be. So, it sounds like there's room for personality even within the world of B2B marketing. And oh, yeah. I mean, if you're talking trade show strategy specifically, like one of the videos could be um, like we were talking about, I'm going to this this event in Cabo uh, through, it's called the Founders uh, Organization or Scalable. And the, co the conversation is like, what do you pack? And so as a B2B company, if I wanted to use this to get some exposure, I'm literally going to create a video of my packing list. And mm -hmm. like, that's me as a creator, but if Simple Strat put it out and said, hey, download our packing list, you know, I could probably get some leads from that. So I think there's just, you have to get outside of your box of like, everybody's ready to buy today and we're going top of funnel and we're saying, how do I create interesting content? So people just go, you know what? That company is different. I kind of want to pay attention to them because attention, time and convenience are the currency that we all have today. Exactly, exactly. And, and the fact that you're walking the walk, not just talking the talk. Yeah, too, right. For like, sure. you know, hey, they're actually doing this. They're actually pro promoting this. They're actually doing this. This to your point earlier, how, how, how can I take what you do and apply it to my company? Well, that's, mm -hmm. that's the want and the need. Um, how long has HubSpot hacks been around for again? We started right before the pandemic. Um, really just uh, serendipitously. Mm -hmm. Like we, we saw the day that, I mean, literally a lot of the businesses decided to close their doors or kind of lay off people. And we saw, <laughs> Everyone's staff went from half and all of a sudden it was like, what is HubSpot and what the heck do I do with it? Oh um, and so we saw our traffic just skyrocket and like the need to go digital was super, super crazy. Now we're seeing a lot of um, three problems and that is fix my, we'll call it dumpster fire. Like HubSpot can, it's, it's innovated so fast that keeping up with the pace of change relative to how your organizational processes work is just almost like impossible. So fix my HubSpot, um, teach my, like get my team to use it more effectively and then help us execute. Um, so, so we use that leverage to, to really build the channel, but now we're just, uh, we're on kind of autopilot. Like we have a process down, we have an editing flow, we have templates used in a premiere. So now it's much more like a, like an assembly line. Very cool. And scalable, right? To your point earlier. So, yep. Yeah, it started with just, you know, a couple like me in the videos, then we moved in to have other people. Now there's three of us that that do videos and we'll soon be adding a fourth. So when you're finding people that do videos uh, for these testimonials, are they are they folks that typically do video outside of their job? Like, are they like streamers or gamers Ooh. or anything else? But just they just take to it. No, I mean, for so one thing I'll say, if you're if you're going to go on to YouTube as a B2B company with human personalities, you do need to have people that are comfortable on camera and know what it's going to take from them to be on camera consistently. Um, now, we do have a couple of situations where like we're repurposing, let's say, webinar content or if people hold a one to one learning session once a month, we can make that content into YouTube as well. But we're taking a much more like cutting room um, approach to it where you have to go through and find the sections that make sense and then almost like rearrange the content so the hooks are in the right places. Right. Um, much like you would a, a written blog. 
Got you. Got you. Um, Ali, was there anything else that you wanted to go over today? I mean, I think I'm, I'm just excited to see where this goes for folks in the coming year, because we are up against so much of a, a wall with a lot of this AI, like content agencies are struggling to try and prove the value of written content. Everyone's right. saying they want to lean into video, but people are like, how do I convert this? How do I track it? So, um, if that's you, I mean, I, I think experimenting and then finding out what works and what doesn't work is the first step. There's no, there's no playbook that's going to get you guaranteed results. That's great. And where can we find you online? Yeah, so you can go to HubSpot Hacks on YouTube. Um, if you just, there's a chance if you type in HubSpot literally on YouTube, you'll probably see us. But um, we've got a channel there. We do have um, a lot of resources available for folks over at simplestrat.com, um, S I M P L E S T R A T.com. And then I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, Ali Schwanke. Um, you can search for that. And I think we have a webinar coming up tomorrow that uh, we'll be talking about lead nurturing. So, um, one, one question about LinkedIn, because yeah, I love LinkedIn as well. And the amount of traffic coming from it just continues to grow. Is there room to market your YouTube videos on LinkedIn and within LinkedIn and then how so? Or should someone be utilizing, should someone be uploading the video to LinkedIn separately? Um, so yes, okay, a little bit of both. So nobody wants to watch your 20 minute video on LinkedIn. It's just like, <laughs> that's probably not true. However, I'm definitely one of those people that caters to what the platform wants. So if the platform wants me to upload native video and that tends to outperform links, then you should do it. Like it doesn't really matter. Um, so I think you gotta kind of test that. But as a general rule, we always encourage people to post their video to LinkedIn at least three times with three different hooks because mm -hmm. you, I mean, it's a video. Like if you don't post a hook, then you're only relying on the title to sell it. And that might not be the case. This is also where your thumbnail can be absolute game changer. I put a video out a while ago that was about HubSpot playbooks. I had on a hat. I was holding the like football and I had the eye black on. Like that's just interesting. And people are like, that's cool. I'm going to click on that. So back to social media basics, like you got to have a way to make it interesting. Um, and then LinkedIn just released today the ability to sponsor employees posts on companies pages. Super oh, really? cool. Super cool. I'm actually running a test right now um, on it. Launched it this morning. And so I, I, I think that's going to be the golden ticket to get, to get LinkedIn uh, results for creators. I'll have to check that out later. Yeah. yeah so it's pretty cool. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Ali Schwanke, it's been a pleasure hosting you today, learning more about YouTube, how YouTube can be utilized for B2B businesses, SaaS businesses, things like that. And uh, about the HubSpot hacks and Simple Strat story. It's awesome to hear. And it's only been like, what, a three-year program, right? Uh, starting yep. pre-pandemic. So Hey, you know what? It's just a question. It sounds like you identified a space, identified a need, went for it. And then um, now that's generating more business and revenue for you, even outside of your HubSpot channel. So that's, that's really amazing. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. Awesome. Awesome. And thank you to the team at Channable for sponsoring today's episode of the SEJ show. Ali, it's, it's been a pleasure. Um, looking forward to connecting in the future. And is there anything you'd like to say before we sign off? No, nope. thanks everybody for joining us. All right. Thanks so much. Have a good one. Thank you for joining us this week on the Search Engine Journal Show. If you liked this episode, subscribe to our channel for so much more and click the notification bell so you don't